home is aware of his achievements, but William, no slouch as well. No. Looking through his record just now, many first place finishes at regional level events. Also a regional champion this season with Charizard EX as well, so both players well first in the Charizard EX game plan here. You know, William is piloting Charizard EX with that Pidgeot EX combination. Azul switching to the other side and knowing that he's going to be facing up against a lot of Charizard does probably take a slightly favorable matchup there. Lost Zone Giratina was heavily criticized by Azul, <laughs> and here he is piloting it. And one of the greatest aspects of this deck in the current format is how popular Charizard EX is going to be, because not only does that Giratina knock out with its uh, V-Star, Star Requiem, you've also got its main attack with Maximum Belt and that Iron Leaves, which we can see right at the top of the prize cards. Not the best place to have it. No, not at all, as we do see both players with their prizes. That Forest Hill Stone there for William's side of the board. One Pidgey. Again, nothing too much to complain about, but Azul will be sort of, once he gets a chance to go through that deck, be iron up and looking for that Iron Leaves as soon as possible. And it's great for one of those early attacks, uh, trying to set the tempo, and you want to try and keep those um, Giratina V-Stars once you build up the Lost Zone for the Star Requiem. And then uh, maybe you can even recycle that Iron Leaves once you've got an early attack off with it. Yeah, typically this matchup, you know, Giratina V-Star has a lot of time to start using um, the first attack to be able to look at the top four and put two cards into the Lost Zone. But now with Charizard EX playing that Maximum Belt can stretch over that HP and deal damage as we both see players fist bump and we're kicking things off here for our Swiss round six. Looks like Azul will be starting first as well with that Manaphy in the active spot. Not an ideal start on the other side. We see the, the beautiful shining uh, cards from Paldean Fates. You know, this is where, um, you know, these players are really going to try and represent why their deck list is optimal, why it is the best version of that archetype. And one thing I've noticed with quite a few Charizard builds is some interesting cards coming in for consistency. And one card is that Cleffer, uh, underutilized historically, but it's starting to see more play now, and hopefully we'll get a chance to see it in this matchup. It's just one of those other cards to utilize as a support Pokemon. Maybe not trying to put down a Rotom B down to draw cards into your hand. Maybe if you can get a Cleffer down, you know, you're only giving up one prize. You're allowed to, you start activating your cards like Counter Catcher as well, and then you don't have that liability of a two prizer on the bench. The only problem with that Cleffer is the vulnerability it presents without a Jirachi in the deck, with Sableye about in those Lost Box decks. It can really be part of a quick two prize turn with just a single Sableye in the active. So something to think about there. Uh, it's, it's very much like a backup plan, similar to how we saw Celebrations Mew in the last format with Charizard. So Azul just doing a deck check here, uh, looking to get that Comfey onto the bench for some flower selecting. Um, did actually uh, have a Giratina. That might have been the top deck, if starting Manaphy there. Might, yeah, very likely, or just wanting to make sure, maybe wasn't too sure what he's up against, doesn't want to necessarily bench it down until sometimes you need two in play before it just kind of gets gusted up, for example. But knowing now he's got an extra turn, at the very least, there's an opportunity to utilize it. And there's the jet energy that we have seen before as well to promote the company into the active spot. Mirage Gate being selected as the first lost zone here in this round six. A nice easy retreat into the second comfy from that flower select. And now we're just dancing away. Ooh, and, uh, so early Comfey's found off those flower selectings and it's uh, going to be the Giratina benched, ready to attack in the future. And this is one of the beauties of Giratina V-Star into the Charizard matchup is those Giratina Vs and V-Stars are safe early on mm -hmm. uh, from being knocked out. So you can safely put them onto the bench and in a lot of matchups you wouldn't be able to. You just see there as all prize checking uh, writing it down on his notepad. And on the other side, William will be going through their deck to prize check with that nest ball. Yeah, 100%. Just kind of, again, as all knows, he's got an additional turn. He's already got, already got two in the lost zone. William will be just looking to try to build out that board, to get set up with those Pidgeys and Charmanders, ready to go as soon as possible. Of course, doesn't want to give up any sort of easy prizes. Knowing he's facing up against a Giratina deck, he's going to know that he doesn't, he knows he has to play around things like Iron Leaves, despite it, him not knowing that it's prize right now. And Greninja as well, another aspect of what makes Giratina so threatening to Charizard. You do have to start thinking about putting the Manaphy down. You do have to start thinking about protecting yourself from those two prize turns, whether it be Iron Leaves, Greninja, a Giratina V-Star attack. 
And that's where the, the route to victory tends to be through two prizes the whole way through. Yeah, I mean, it was very early selected into the front of the deck with those nest balls there as well. As we do see just William just kind of now shuffling up. Just those other options there. It looks like that Rotom V has hit the field as well. Opportunity to retreat into the mana feed just for the time being. Just to give himself some breathing space as we do see the instant charge there. Draw free and end your turn back over to Azul. Yeah, no cancelling clone to worry about here. When you put a mana fee in play and Greninja is a opposing you, you have to always wonder, is cancelling cologne combinations going to be there mm -hmm. like it is in Shen Pao or Golden Go, but rarely do you see that in uh, Giratina. It's normally in just the, the, the Lost Box variants that uh, we saw popularised with Roaring Moon, Iron Hands and Hooper recently. Yeah, we've mentioned how Giratina could potentially stretch and breach that 330 damage as we do see now the second flower selecting that Sableye hitting the Lost Zone, just the one copy uh, in Azul's list. Um, but as we continue, so the, the A spec of choice for Azul this time is actually a prime catcher. Just like the maneuverability is more important for him rather than the damage output. Yeah, so, so many people putting maximum belt into the Giratina V-Star, trying to use that lost impact to reach the Charizard knockout, but prime catcher stronger across the rest of the matches. And so that Lost Zone really building up now as we see Azul at four, will Ooh. be able to now use the Cramorant to knock out the lone Charmander in play. And that is a huge turn for Azul for Tempo. Yeah, that Cramorant being able to attack for no energy cards because of four in the loss zone now following four flower selects uh, from Azul. And just that boss's orders doesn't even need to utilize the Chorus's experiment and just spit innocently onto that Char Charmander. Well, we saw off of the in instant charge last turn, the uh, Buddy Buddy Poffin was there. So William will be able to stabilize the board after that uh, very frustrating early knockout. Charmander, you've only got one Charmander down. You're always susceptible to a turn delay with that knockout. And that's what mm -hmm. we saw there. Now we're going to try and double up on the Charmanders to guarantee a Charizard. But yeah, let's go back to that Aspex. I think that's probably the most interesting part of this matchup. Do you think William's going to be playing around what he thinks is going to be a maximum belt? I mean, there's only so much you can do. You have a big 330 HP uh, Charizard EX. You can't really boost the HP on it or do too much. You're just going to have to start swinging away. But you're just going to have to build up the board to a position where you have maybe multiple so you can keep ramping up your damage. If one gets taken out from Star Requiem, for example, um, then it's nothing too much to worry about as he looks like a third Charmander is coming down now following that poor singular shiny Charmander taken down from that boss's orders as we do see another instant charge hmm, good cards in there the yeah. Arvin will be able to get things set up next turn opportunity for Azul to continue progressing down the prize race does only have one Giratina V on the board right now as we do see the first chorus experiment in round six here Five such cards. a good card so good to just kind of see all the pieces and just remove the ones that you don't necessarily need. Yeah, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Lost Engine, you can see just uh, below Azul's face cam there, trying to get that Lost Zone count, the number of cards in the Lost Zone, as high as possible for various different thresholds. You've got the, the Cramorant, which we just saw with the Spit Innocently, which at the four threshold can attack for free. Mm -hmm. You've then got seven, which is another key moment, and that's when your Mirage Gates can be utilized. And then sometimes you'll see... Uh, in different versions of Lost Zone decks, 10 being a key point, whether it be for Sableye or for that Star Requiem for Giratina V-Star. And so getting that Lost Zone count as high as possible early on, as Azul has done here, really sets you up for the rest of the game and thins out a lot of those cards you don't want to be seeing again. Yeah, big flower selecting there. Um, unfortunately, has to pitch away into the Lost Zone, that Chorus experiment, but it was the Giratina V-Star that was picked up. And we do see the first Mirage Gate as well, a Psychic Energy and a Grass Energy attached to that Giratina V-Star there, just waiting in the wings to start plowing through where possible um, as Azul's just shuffling up following that. Will he just go back into the crammer and maybe take another prize? I mean, Does keep it out of range still of the Charizard EX, and that's the key aspect here. Yeah, Giratina V-Star will be safe from Charizard EX for a, another few knockouts. As we see, another prize taken. That Iron Lee's right up at the top, out of range of Azul. 
taking it, and so now uh, has to start thinking about a different game plan. Was probably hoping to find the Iron Leaves early on there, off the prize cards. Now, different strategy needed, but getting far enough ahead that maybe a Cramoran into a Giratina uh, or something similar will be possible. Yeah, Williams just having to try and navigate these turns now. Currently, a Charizard EX, should William get one out, will be dealing 240 damage. So 180 from that Burning Darkness, plus 30 more for every prize that Azul's taken. So that's 260 more damage output, 240. And it's only the Choice Belt which is able to sort of help ramp up more damage, but 270 is not quite enough yet. Not at all, and that prone catcher really helps you target the Pidgeot EX as well, as that's only got 280 HP, so that allows the Giratina to knock it out early on, and then that allows you to keep that Star Requiem for when you want to knock out the Charizard EX. You can even go via the Rotom V and a Pidgeot, for example, and never actually need to quite hit that Charizard EX in this matchup if you start like you have here, where you can get a few one prizes. Yeah, there's likely going to be three two prizes on Williams' board now. That Pidgeot EX just being evolved up via the rare candy, of course, skipping that stage one Pidgeotto. Straight up to that stage two, now being able to utilize that free retreat pivot and the quick search ability of that fantastic Pidgeot EX card. Well, Charizard EX, the most popular deck in the room, but with a massive target on it. Every single deck here wants to try and beat it. And there's a way to knock out a Giratina V-Star. Mm -hmm. Radiant Charizard with Choice Belt. It will require a, a big investment of energy, but it will be a way to get that knockout now, which could completely change this game. Does William have the cards and the combo pieces to be able to do so? There's the quick search after the Ultra Ball for that Charizard EX. Rare Candy being selected. Infernal Rain's going to be coming down shortly to start powering up one of his Pokemon. This is the decision to make here. Is there enough combo pieces? Choice Belt looks like it's in hand. Is there a counter catcher? That's the real question, because that's the final piece of the puzzle. Only playing six fire energy as well. William has to be really careful. Uh, not going to be actually able to go for that Charizard just yet. Might be saving that one for a counter knockout later on. Mm -hmm. um, but that would have been too many pieces just there for William. But interesting to note that if you able to get one more card in that combo, the Radiant Charizard would have been able to take a knockout in the Giratina V-Star. Yeah, we do see a Charmeleon evolution up as well, stage one, as the Charizard EX goes to the active spot. Radiant Charizard waiting in the wings now as the first prize is taken from William's side of the board, and it's on Azul to just be able to try and deal with this Charizard EX in the active position. Yeah, another Giratina V down would be useful here. Maybe taking out the Pidgeot EX would be useful here. There's a lot of things for Azul to do, but with it not in hand, it's going to be tricky to know exactly what the correct strategy is as a little bit of digging will be required for Azul. Yeah, Azul would need to find that Prime Catcher because he only plays one boss. One boss, one Prime Catcher, one Counter Catcher are the counts in Azul's list. So therefore, it's a little bit of a stretch. Does have Chorus's Experiment, can dig quite far into the deck. We'll see at least seven cards here. This is the Counter Catcher, but it's not going to be much use right now. Easy choice here. The water energy goes as well because not going to be trying to utilize maybe the Greninja. Just double checking maybe with no mana fear down. Is that an easy way to try and take two prizes or steal two prizes? Just I mean, second guessing himself. One already in the lost zone. Oh, he's actually going to keep that water energy just in case. Just as an option. I like it. I mean, that, that would be a huge turn, right? Not even having to worry about. Uh, utilizing that Giratina V-Star. I think still needs some pieces, though. Looks like Ooh. a Nest Ball option there. Nest Ball or Giratina V. You need both of them, because you want the Nest Ball for the Greninja, but you also kind of want the Giratina V yep. and committing to that route here. Maybe the slightly safer play here, where Giratina V was the selection, <laughs> of course. Um, that Nest Ball going straight in. Now we're into 11 in the Lost Zone, so it does mean we've hit the threshold for Star Requiem to be able to be utilized here. And just setting up two Giratinas would be huge, but unable to evolve the bench Giratina V now will mean that it wouldn't be guaranteed next turn, and that would lead William to down some disruption. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's always a huge factor when you're playing these matchups. Disruption can completely change the end game, especially for a Lost Zone deck, um, very susceptible to those end game disruptions. Yeah, and Iono coming down will put Azul, if Azul is able to take the two prizes here from an attack, 
It would mean an Iona will put him down to two cards. But he's got to think, well, I'm still in a good position. William still needs three attack announcements before William could win the game. As we do see the attachment retreat, super rod of some of those energies and the Cramorant as well. And a very efficient attacker, of course. Mirage Gate being utilized alongside that combo piece of the super rod to power up a second Giratina. So Azul just playing to his outs. Prime Catcher still in the deck as well. We've mentioned it before, Finning is winning. I mean, it does leave quite a lot for us all to get if that disruption comes through from William. You know, Iono, a great option for disruption, but Roxanne now starting to appear in Charizard list. So if Azul has great cards coming up in the next few turns, William can completely change that order of the deck by using the Roxanne for disruption, where Iono, you draw off the top, and uh, it's, a, it's a great way to disrupt decks which are comfortable with what's in the deck and coming off the Iono. So we're just considering benching a third Comfe here, knowing that there will be a very likelihood chance of just simply seeing uh, some disruption. Hasn't hit the Iron Leaves EX there, which is really unfortunate from Azul as well, because I'm sure he was banking on that 50-50 to try and hit it out the prizes. Another V-Star in there as well. Mm -hmm. That is tough. Those two prize cards, both of them the, the exact cards Ooh. needed for next turn. Uh, is that a Roxanne that I just saw picked up? as well from William's side of the board. That Let's is, play one copy of it. That is exactly what you need in these final moments. We're talking about it just now. The disruption of Roxanne is unique compared to Iono because not only are they shuffling in and drawing the cards so they don't have the control over what they see, mm -hmm. but you're also gaining six cards as a Charizard player, so you potentially find more of those combo pieces for future turns and can set yourself up in a much nicer position. And we've mentioned it before, that Radiant Charizard is ready to go with that Choice Belt attached as well. We'll be dealing 280 damage with that fantastic Excited Heart ability. Combustion Blast dealing 250 damage plus 30 from the Choice Belt. Um, and because of that Excited Heart reducing the energy cost required to take the knockout, there's a great opportunity here for William to just try and swing it back into his favor. Yeah, no switch in the deck, so no way to reset that card easily, but does have the Professor Turo scenario. Mm -hmm. And when you have a, something like a Pidgeot EX, you can always grab it when you need it. Exactly, and reset it once again. So big turn here. What, I wonder what Azul has been able to pull out from their Roxanne to two. I mean, they put a Temple of Sinnoh in play, so their jet energies won't be live anymore. I don't know if they have any more in deck. But the jet energy, not possible to use. Temple of Sinnoh being put down to thin it out of the deck in preparation for the Roxanne. But I wonder if that could reduce options. We'll see in just a moment. Azul keeping his hand close to the table, not letting us see it. On the other side, William really trying to set up the most optimal end game board state. And this is why Charizard is so good right now. Yeah, that's a second Charizard coming down with that Infernal Rain energy attachments to it. William just kind of playing out the game plan in his mind now. Remember, he does need three attacks to go off to win this game because of the five prizes that are remaining here. But Charizard EX will start to swing away because four prizes taken. Has decided to go down the route of taking out the Giratina V on the bench. Interesting. Just worried about having the Charizard stuck in the active, mm, yeah, maybe? For sure. Still out of range. Maybe knowing that the maximum belt isn't in the list. Maybe you've got that knowledge that it's prime catcher, not maximum belt. Because that's something we mentioned before, right? Is that the, uh, the maximum belt typically found in the Lost Zone Giratina on this occasion for us all, it's not. But then still, the Iron Leaves could at any moment just come straight down. So William banking heavily that the Iron Leaves is not accessible. Yeah, and it could be a great read. But I think that's why he was maybe a little bit stressing out on the scenario here. Roxanne's switch picked up. Switch could be useful to just kind of keep going through the deck and seeing more cards, but Roxanne just gives you a chance to maybe see you further. Prime Catcher in hand in swell, so it can take an easy knockout, potentially. Oh, a huge opportunity here. Prime Catcher onto that Rotom is an easy two-prizer available, and it would also need to be retreated as well. Um, either of the Pidgeot EX and the Rotom are so available. this is it, big Roxanne. Just needs to get an energy off of this Roxanne. This could be huge. Just super rodded as well. So just shuffling up. This is a big six-carder here for Azul. 
I mean, Roxanne is always the dream card to find off of someone else roxanne you <laughs> as it completely resets the game back the other way. So Azul here needs one energy off of these six cards to take game one. Can he find it? Will he get it? There, there it is. The grass energy attachment there and a lost impact for the final two prizes of game one there. Azul going one game up in round six. Just such an early start for him, taking out the first Charmander and the only Charmander in play with a Cramorant gave him the time to set up and allowed him to not need the Iron Leaves, which was right at the top of those prize cards and inaccessible for the whole game. Azul going up 1-0 here in round six. Yeah, that Iono, no, so, not Iono, that Roxanne was really kind to Azul. In the it end. was. <laughs> um, alongside, of course, the draw, so three card scene plus a further two from the flower selecting. But yeah, super kind as we do get a glimpse of the replay here, recap, we know Iron Leaves was prized, so Azul had to work around that throughout as we saw the early KO, as Mike, you just mentioned on that Charmander. Yeah, Iron Leaves specifically in there for this matchup, as it's such a great way to knock out a Charizard EX. Um, but of course, it doesn't need to be there. It doesn't need to be used if there are other routes around it, especially with a slow start for William. Hopefully here in game two, William can get a little bit more stable at the start. Multiple Charmanders down. Uh, but it was also quite fortunate for us all to find that early boss, get the cram run out, and really get things going. Just showing um, <laughs> why Giratina V-Star is a good deck. And I think he's come around to it finally and realized that it does have the consistency and ability to get those wins. And here we see the prizes for game two. Oh, massive prize there from William's side of the board. That's, oh, no, it's an EX Pokemon, so excuse me. I think the, the Cleffer, <laughs> the MVP. The <laughs> that we haven't seen yet. Um, but this side, it, it has opted to go second again. Azul leading that spirit tomb. Fettered in misfortune. Yes, it has and will be, as it's going to be stopping that Rotom V coming down and drawing cards. But this is where maybe Cleffer would have been really good. <laughs> but we see it in the prizes. Yeah, I mean, spirit tomb is great against Snorlax. Not that Giratina has a bad matchup into Snorlax, but one of the huge options it cuts away is that Luminion V and it really takes down these draw engines, the, the basic V draw engines, like Rotom V, like Luminion, uh, to find your supporters. And so the Spirit Team Fetid and Misfortunes found its way into Azul's Lost Zone Giratina list as it's probably one of the better matchups to start it in. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a great card in this scenario. I mean, at any opportunity, you can also try and maybe just fade away as well, fade out, just back into the hand if you really want to get out the active spot. Um, but at the same time, you're just impacting a slower to get, slowing the game down. We've already known Giratina has had a bit of a slower game plan when you go sort of, you trying to utilize um, Giratina V's first attack, of course. Yeah. And this meta and format and rotation has maybe kind of played into that a little bit. Exactly. I mean, many people will have put those spirit tombs away thinking that the only utility was going to be for the, uh, the Genesect V disruption in the Mu VMAX deck. Uh, pre-rotation, uh, but it is still a viable disruption card as we're seeing it now. As mentioned, Rotom V and Luminium V will not be happy seeing that on the board. Concealed cards there, just missing Buddy Buddy Poffins, I believe, but of course can utilize that card later on. So it's one of sort of the advantages of Lost Zone decks utilizing uh, Buddy Buddy Poffin rather than the pre-rotation battle VIP passes. Yeah, you'd really force the dig turn one, wouldn't you? And it, it forced a lot of decks to go second yep. last format purely because of the Battle VIP pass being such a key card. And that is a question here. William opting to go second and, you know, Giratina happy to go uh, in into the game second or first. Mm -hmm. And so really, you start to wonder, does Charizard want to start going first more now? Ooh, that's a choice of a Giratina V going into the Lost Zone. Energy attachment to the active, giving himself a pivot option. Interesting decision there by Azul. The other card had to be very good to be able to do that. Yeah, you're going to be looking at that. William's going, what have you got in your hand now? Yeah. <laughs> Giratina V should not be the one going into the Lost Zone. Hang on a moment. It's just Surely an energy attachment not. and the boss's orders on that oh, spirit no. tomb. <laughs> it must have been that Chorus's <laughs> experiment. It has to be. Is it typically the only option? Did he just top deck a second one? Yeah, no, not like this. This is not how you want your, your tournament to go. You're getting that 
It's just a nest ball he really needs because he can, I think, switch into the Comfe and get the fourth into the loss zone now. And then that would activate lost provisions into Spit innocently. Just working out whether the Buddy Buddy Poffin's correct here. Um, choosing not to go for it. Yeah, I maybe would have liked to have seen him maybe hold on to that and utilize, get more Comfe's down because of switch cut and switch in hand. Oh, if they get nest ball here, that is game. But Azul, still in a commanding position, even if the knockout does not happen here, does have some draw off of that concealed cards too. Counter catcher, Jet Energy. And now we're going to see a draw off that concealed card. Two big cards. And that's going to be draw one, draw two. Not, not quite. quite. Oh, Cramorant not finding its way out into play, but then, you know, still a very strong position for Azul here. Yeah, here we go. The power of that Abyss Seeking is going to come to fruition now. Utilizing that first attack, put four cards into your hat. Well, four cards. Look at four cards, sorry. And two into the Lost Zone. Didn't really see another way still to get <laughs> that. But the Giratina V-Star also hitting the Lost Zone now. On William, does he draw anything? There's a Buddy Buddy Poffin. He's in the game. Welcome back to the game, William. <laughs> it's a start at least. This Time is the to first. find them. First deck search, maybe he might be looking for that Cleffa here. And then <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, I mean, but this is it, right? We said about how the start from Azul last game was very fast and the start from William was slow. But if you exaggerate that to an extreme level, that is exactly what we are seeing right here. Unfortunate poker face just kind of not being shown by William. I think he just kind of <laughs> just showcased his grimace as he's searched through the deck and is unable to pick out the Cleffa as an option. And those of you who are fans of Azul will know that he's a big fan of Cleffa. So maybe at this stage, William was, was, was going to tell him, I'll get to show you, show you the Cleffa. You've always wanted to see it played. <laughs> uh, but unfortunately, as you mentioned, in the prize cards, um, one of those cards that, you know, for the players who've been playing a while, you've seen in cards like Cleffa. Mm -hmm. In fact, other versions of Cleffa be so effective at setting up in early stages. How does this Cleffa compare to Cleffas of old? I mean, they, they used to have sort of baby abilities, quote unquote, bodies types effects where if you try and attack it, they'd have to flip a coin. And if it's tails, then it's the attack just doesn't happen and things like that. But also having that ability to just kind of shuffle and draw, draw up to seven seems to be quite typical of something like a clever or just baby Pokemon. We do get a call for family as well, which is at least something. Another great attacker early yep. on, you know, like if you've got a single prizer with Call for Family on it that evolves into something else that's really good, like Pidgeot EX, it's a definite inclusion. And that's why uh, the Pidgeot EX engine is so good, because you have that addition of Pidgey. I mean, we've seen the same thing uh, be true of the, the, the Chinchino in Lugia. Mm -hmm. Having that Call for Family on the Minchino makes such a difference uh, to the viability of that evolution line. I think there's still a lot for William to get. He's still looking for that top deck to get out of the position he's in. There's a couple of oh, Pidgeot yeah. EXs in hand, Professor Truro scenario, maybe one other. As the source just kind of, well, I'm going to keep drawing through my deck, seeing as many cards as possible. Chorus's experiment here, there, and everywhere. Another two will be hitting the Lost Zone. Does mean he'll be hitting that eight beyond the seven and to that eight threshold, and will be able to start utilizing things like Mirage Gate. Um, thankfully, William has put down and kept the Manaphy on the board as well, so Greninja can't really come down and sort of snipe away at two Charmanders. I mean, but as far as uh, turns go, where William was last turn versus where William is now, I think stabilization is a fair way to describe that. That board looking a lot better now, but as we mentioned, is all so far through that lost zone uh, oh. count that he's in a very good position. Here we go, Sableye being targeted down. We've seen a, a number of Giratina pieces hit the Lost Zone. Azul identifying well. William's start is incredibly slow. Those really small, low HP Pokemon are just kind of sitting there waiting for Azul to just actually pick away with Lost Mine as soon as he hits the 10 in the thresholds. On eight right now, I believe. Yeah, so might need to use the Abyss Seeking here, knowing that one of those Pidgeys will probably stay in play. Could go into the Comfe with a switch. Could retreat into a second Comfe. Uh, I guess he wouldn't be able to retreat into it using the energy because he can't. Oh, he, no. Yeah, he wouldn't be able to because he was going into the Comfe. So does need to find another switch out. Ooh, chorus and water. I mean, the water energy, not too much of a concern now, especially with the Manaphy in play. We're up to nine. I mean, there we There's go. A 10 coming down. 
We're, we're, we're flower selecting dancing right now. We're pivoting between them. This will hit 10. Water energy again and a Cramorant. And this is the challenge when you're slow against Lost Zone, you open up more options. Sableye, Star Requiem, they're all available now. And Azor just sitting here looking at a board where he can disrupt it heavily with a Sableye. Very rarely do you get to see a Sableye utilized by a Lost Zone deck against a Charizard deck before it's even evolved anything. And that could be the case right here. Yeah, and this is the one true concern from William's side of the board because we know there are 60 HP Pidgeys available, but it's gone with the 50 HP because of that Call for Family attack. Such a great attack. We've highlighted it already. Energy's attachment from the Mirage Gate to the Giratina V here. But 50 HP Charmander has a maximum of 70 as well. Perfect math for that Lost Mine attack. I mean, even that Charmander, which uh, used Heat Tackle, that's now on 50 HP. Oh, so yeah, you can take course. out both Charmanders here with a Sableye. And we'll be oh, getting that go. Manaphy into the active attach and can knock out both the Charmanders, evolve the Giratina, showing exactly how powerful the Lost Engine is. And it's this Sableye that unlocks so much potential when you get that count nice and high. And that Prime Catcher, again, showcased by Azul, rather than something like that maximum belts there. Just kind of, again, maybe considering using that Mirage Gate to fin through the deck a little bit more. Maybe give a pivot option for one of his comp phase. Set up if, energy for Iron Leaves. Yeah, potentially as well, as there goes. Yeah, there's the Iron Leaves energy and then the pivot option from the Psychic. And Azul is truly in a commanding position here. Just staring down at that chart, the two Charmander, I to say. Oh, the Lost Mine has been sprinkled and it's taken out both the Charmander. In hindsight, that heat tackle <laughs> might have been a mistake, but in that situation, William had almost accepted that he was on the back foot. And from here, with a Pidgeot EX in play, this is going to be one of the greatest comebacks if we see William come back in this game. No Charmander on board. Azul fully set up with a Sableye in the active, ready to take knockout. The Pidgey and the Manaphy both can be knocked out next turn with that Lost Mine. So William now not only has to put Charmanders in play, but he has to put two of them in because of the Sableye. And until that happens, this could be tough. Yeah, this is uh, backs up against the wall here for William. What can he conjure up from this Charles RDX deck? Remember, both players are well-versed with the Charles RDX deck. Both regional champions with Charles RDX, which is a fantastic thing to see. Just showcases the power and just consistency of the deck itself. I mean, William bringing it here and is currently 5-0 up against Azul, also 5-0 with this record. Does find a Charaz Radiant Charizard, but doesn't look like we're gonna be able to get very far here. Oh, it's so tough. Once you get on the back foot, it's really hard to come back in this current format. Uh, you know, you got the hand disruption, but everything is on board for Azul here. And nothing is on board for William except for that Pidgeot EX. And so we're going to have to really find the, the dream scenario here. It's going to have to be a lot of disruption. I mean, when you've got something like Charizard, you don't even have the ability to utilize things like Sableye. You can't play around the active. You just have to knock out the, the big thing in the active spot. There's just no way to get an attack off here to remove the Sableye from, from play. Um, as of right now, has to play the Nest Ball. I mean, if he is able to get another Charmander down, it's just an easy picking off target for a further two prizes. And then it's just a Pidgeot EX again, alongside that Radiant Charizard future t on the future turn. <laughs> Do not envy you right now, William. Doesn't even find an option here. I mean, we, we look at these kind Charmander of games. Charmander in hand, sorry. I mean, it's 1-0 to us all. William is, you know, not going to be able to go to a game three. He's on the back foot here. So this is one of those games where if you were watching this and you had still had another life in your best of three, mm -hmm. you'd potentially just scoop up and say, let's go next. But at this stage, William has to try and find a, a backdoor win condition that's not obvious at this stage. And it's just going to be so tricky with everything on board. And uh, that's, that's the... The crux of it, as we see, is that a lost mine there? Yeah, the question is whether he will remove the Manaphy or just start putting some damage on the Pidgeot EX as well because, uh, yeah, this is a scenario here. By keeping it like this, William's not able to attach two energies in one go. So if there's just one Charmander that goes down, it's an easy target again. 
because that Manaphy's been pushed down to five um, HP or 50 HP left. And we've got the, the Roxanne available now for William, but again, everything is on board for us all. So you can disrupt the hand all you like, but at the end of the day, what more does he need? What more does he need? He's got a powered up Giratina ready to attack. He's got energy on his uh, come face to, to, to switch him out. Everything's there ready. And especially as you've already mentioned, there's no, just no switch card in William's deck list right now. The only possible way to pivot out is a Professor Churro's scenario. Radiant Charizard hitting the field as well, and a Roxanne holding on to that Charmander. There's no point putting it down because it's just easy pickings. If it even goes goes to it or comes to it, as it were, William won't be getting another attack off. That's the worrying thing here. Well, Charizard being our first repeated deck on stream, it's struggled in both occasions. First time was against Xian Pao. Xian Pao, very strong matchup into Charizard. Now we're seeing Losso and Giratina. It does feel like Charizard, despite being the most popular deck at this event, has got some tougher matchups into the other popular decks in the format. But that just that's just credit to Charizard itself. It's so strong across the board mm -hmm. that people are worried about it to the point where we're getting Iron Leaves in their deck list and people are choosing decks that have a strong matchup into it. Yeah, for sure. But we know why people continue to pick Charizard as a deck. It's super consistent typically is able to then just kind of pick at the cards that it needs as we do see the quick search here from William. Um, just kind of iron up any, any opportunity to try and swing the game back his way. As you've already mentioned, his back is fully up against the wall because he can't just concede and give himself no chance in this matchup. But he's in a scenario again where he just can't put one Charmander down. And that's the difficulty here because that Sableye is just going to keep going. It's, there's no stopping it. No, I mean, the, the ability to get Iono and Roxanne towards the end game for Charizard, typically very disruptive, um, especially with decks that are racing to try and beat you. They might not be fully set up. And uh, on this occasion, I keep mentioning it, Azul has everything on board ready to go, pretty much. Um, I mean, the Spiritomb coming into the active spot there. If, if Azul's out of energy, that could be a way to, to disrupt. But other than that, it looks to be just sort of a hopeful gusting there. I wonder if he really needed to find a way to combo that that gust, that counter catcher with a Charmander down, maybe just kind of force the issue, like saying this is the only chance I have but now because of the way the board state is, there's no further Charmander that has been placed because he had to quick search for that counter catcher it looked like he's just still up against it again, no energies as well, he just had to attach it to the Radiant Charizard here and Manaphy's just sitting pretty. There's an energy in hand from Azul already, straight back into the Sableye. A third running of Lost Mine. 360 damage counters would have been placed now. And he's just going to slowly target and whittle down William's board. And that's perfect play because there's no, there's no maneuverability here. <laughs> 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 yeah, okay. Well, it's definitely not okay, but I think it's just a kind of a, a showcase. Like, yeah, it is just double checking 11 going on to the. Radiant Charizard, keeping seven available for a Charmander to come down. Lovely stuff. Where's that other one going? Going to be going on to the Pidgeot EX. I don't think it matters too much where it goes. Just making sure that whatever comes into play here, like you mentioned, another Charmander trying to come down will not be enough. And it's almost like locking William out of yeah. the game with the main attacker. It's been the case in both games, really targeting down those Charmanders early on to set up these end games. Yeah, Azul's got to be feeling pretty good right now just because of the board state and of course playing around where those scenarios of what William could do. I mean, William hasn't been able to just get another Charmander down because it's just at, at the mercy of that Sableye. Like I said, 360 damage counters dropped by Lost Mine already in this game too. That's not something you really want to be facing up against. 360 is more than the Charizard EX's HP. After all. Yeah, I mean, typically we don't see a Sableye last this long, but on this particular occasion, it's been able to last this long just because there's been no return attack from William. That Manaphy being gusted into the active with the Prime Catcher, what is widely considered the strongest ace spec in the game right now. And it's for that reason, you could not only get a big knockout, you could not only disrupt in the same turn as using it, but you can set yourself up with these attackers on the bench 
put them into the active whilst gusting up the, the least useful card on your opponent's side. And that was the Manaphy on this occasion. So excited heart from the ability from the Radiant Charizard right now. It's one less from each prize taken. It's only three. So it's just a retreat into the Radiant Charizard for the time being to try and protect the Manaphy, I guess, from a potential KO for the easy knockout on the double uh, Charmanders that have just been placed on the Buddy Buddy Poffin. This is just an unfortunate scenario here for William. Had to utilize the Rotom V with a Forest Seal Stone as well. We mentioned earlier about how the Heat Tackle Charmander yeah. is great, yeah, but that's going to be it. Azul has taken the victory with Losso and Giratina just completely stopping the Charizard deck from functioning, removing Charmanders from play left, right, and center. And unfortunately, a slower start here for William led to back-to-back -back losses, but obviously still in a wonderful position. Five wins, one loss. We'll be looking to go forward and still be in contention for day two, but Azul now just one point away from his spot in day two here at EUIC. Yeah, we're getting to the crunch point now where players getting to the sort of 6-0 positions, but continue playing out their games to try and push themselves as close to the point threshold you require to not just make day two, but to be as close as possible for that top eight spot. Because that's really, really where you want to be as we get a recap once again of the whole round here. We saw the Iron Leaves prize in game one. I mean, if you said to someone, you're playing Losso and Giratina, what's the worst possible prize card you could have against Charizard? They'd say Iron Leaves, but it didn't stop us all. Just taking out those small Pokemon, getting the knockouts early on to get a, a nice lead. And then for the rest of the game, pretty much just not, not fussed about the Charizard EX, getting one of them with the Star Requiem. But outside of that, able to take down the lower HP Pokemon. There you go, there's a Star Requiem on the Charizard. Yeah, incredible attack, that instant KO um, effect of the Giratina V-Star, as William does choose to target down the Giratina V there, an easier target, of course. Um, but then, <laughs> Azul just grimacing, it's just double checking that energy attachment, the sort of gusting effect, which Pokemon to target before Rock Sanding to find the final energy for that lost impact. Game two, less of a matchup, unfortunately, because William just couldn't draw out of that scenario. And that was the first choice, that Iron Leaves EX, and that's why that Giratina V was pitched so early. I think this was the laugh when Cleffa was identified as being, uh, being prized. I mean, it's good to see the players are having fun, you know, having a great record at this time. You know, a lot of these players love playing against each other, international competition. Mm -hmm. You don't often get the opportunity to play against the best of the best from other regions, and they're doing that right here. And unfortunately for William, we'll be taking a loss at this uh, round six stage but still in a great position and with a great deck in Charizard, the most popular deck here at the EUIC by quite a stretch, countered quite heavily by a lot of these other decks being played by top players. You know, we see there Giratina V-Star in a great position, adding in that Iron Leaves, mm -hmm. using that Prime Catcher beautifully there. Azul looking in a very strong position at the top of the leaderboard. Yeah, but just a lot of these Charizard EX players just looking for that consistency to kind of power them through uh, into a day two and maybe beyond and go as far as possible in the tournament this weekend. But it's all really showcasing the just incredible power. I think I highlighted maybe pre us starting all of the streaming broadcasts that Sableye's in a really unique, good position because you kind of just switch really awkward Pokemon into the active spot and you can just spend time setting up KOs. And that's exactly what we saw. We Effectively, we saw 480 damage by a Sableye. The one Sableye as well, the, the singular. One. Didn't even yeah. need to refresh it. And of course, with the Buddy Buddy Poffin format, there are a lot of low HP Pokemon mm -hmm. for Sableye to prey on. And with Pidgey and Heat Tackle Charmander being on the lower end in Charizard, it definitely works wonderfully there. And uh, we saw exactly why Charizard can be a good deck. But unfortunately, like we said, there are a lot of decks that are targeting it. And that's where Charizard hasn't really got the ability to tech against everything else. Because if you put a Mist Energy in there, which we've seen popularized in some Charizard yeah. decks, you have a better Giratina matchup, but then a worse matchup into other decks and so on. So Charizard have to be as consistent as possible and not tech for these individual matchups that are tougher. Well, that's why maybe something like the Temple of Sinnohs are also played in um, Azul's deck as well. He plays two copies of those, you know, that is true. respecting Lugia, because they play a lot more sort of missed energies. 
um, but also just has that kind of knock-on side effect of, well, I can also handle Charizard EX, is another big, bulky Pokemon with Mist Energies as well. I could get that into play and then still utilize Star Requiem and really just take a big knockout out of nowhere. Oh, yeah, 100%. Um, I, I don't know if we do have an interview ready because, like, this is one of those interviews we all want to see, right? Oh, 100%. Uh, can I just get confirmation? Have we got an interview ready yet? <laughs> or are we going to have to wait a little bit longer? I mean, uh, I, I hope we're getting it set up as soon as possible. You know, because Azul's one of those people we all want to just hear from. Yeah, 100%. Uh, one, of the, one of the players doing viewing parties all across the season. Yep. A uh, great insight into how to play the game to a higher level. I'm sure a lot of people watching right now at home will have learned a lot about the, the, the game through that kind of knowledge that he shared. So uh, a wonderful player to get some insight from. We'll hopefully get that in a little bit. But outside of that, let's talk about the whole event here. We've got one of the biggest events in Pokemon history. And of course, 2,595 players, I think it was, in Masters <laughs> here, all piloting a whole plethora of decks. We've seen 11 here on stream. What's been the highlight so far in these first six rounds for you in terms of the decks we've seen? I mean, just the fact that we've seen so many different ones. It's been uh, the first repeat deck that we saw was Charizard EX, right? So just again, all these players and all of them at great records as well. We've seen some really top trainers, top players bring different archetypes. So Vinny bringing Ancient Box, something that a lot of people maybe just kind of pushed aside for the time being. Um, and similarly with Fabio playing a deck which a lot of people push aside as well, Guard of IEX, um, coming out of, you know, from the previous rotation, uh, well, previous format, I should say, to this new rotation. Dialga V-Star earlier on? Yeah. One of the most powerful V-Star attacks out there, Star Kronos. Got to see your boy Matang. Oh, yeah, I mean, I, I do love my, my <laughs> Metagross line. Um, but yeah, Matang, what a powerful card and engine for those Metal-type attackers for the next few years uh, mm -hmm. to be able to potentially power up those huge attacks, especially for Dialga, where it needs so much energy to get going. Yeah, and, and I think I spoke to, I caught up with Chriso separately as well. Obviously, we had a great interview by Chip with Chriso as well, and he was just like, well, if I just set up, I beat everything. Oh, and yeah. That, that's the mindset he's taken, and I know him very well. He's generally quite, quite boisterous about a lot of the way he plays his decks and what he's playing, um, but he's felt in good spirits around it, and it was great to see. Yeah, I mean, a lot of these decks have strong matchups across the board, but want to dodge and weave around certain things. Let's talk about something like Lugia V-Star, such a powerful deck into some of the top uh, decks in the format, but struggles when it comes to something like Iron Hand. So uh, these decks, they, they have their targets, they have their uh, enemies they want to avoid, and currently those top players who are performing with each of the decks have managed to avoid the tougher matchups potentially, but at some point, you will trip up along the way and potentially take a loss to a tougher matchup. But that's where having a large variety of decks, you have to accept some of those you're not going to beat. Yeah, well, well, maybe you don't trip up. Maybe it just, you do. Just keep, oh, keep spiraling, yeah. keep rolling. <laughs> maybe you do overcome your bad matchups and then it's just your day, right? It's just sometimes you've got to ride that wave all the way into day two and maybe all the way to that top eight, top four, final, and maybe call yourself, you know, an international champion. Yeah, there's a few players fighting for their second international championship, maybe third, uh, and they're looking to try and keep that run going. And then there's a lot of people, like you said, maybe regional champions, maybe never even won a major event, mm -hmm. and they're just looking to try and add uh, to their CP count. And they just happen to go on one of those crazy journeys. Yeah. So, so many different storylines for you guys, and make sure you keep following along um, as we are just really getting started here oh. on day one. I mean, only six rounds have gone so far. We've still got three more for day one. And then tomorrow, we've just got another load of rounds where the, all the top players have made it into day two there before we head into sort of those crux rounds of the top eight, top four, and then we'll have our finals on the Sunday here. Yeah, all to go down to a top eight. Imagine that, you've got 2,595 players and only eight of them make it out of Swiss. Uh, it is grueling here, but that's where the best players do come out on top frequently. What's it like, you're, you're the top 0.4% of the tournament? Can someone check that in chat for us and then uh, contact us with the hashtag Pokemon EUIC. I want to see if, a rough, if Alex right? was a, right with that little rough. percentage call out. You were very specific. I mean, 1%. You could have said less than 1%, but well, then one, you... 1% is 25, right? 25, 25 point. Oh, something. very very good. I like and it. And just kind of worked down, so half is 12-ish, 13. Stay in school, keep kids. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. we've had a lot of fun here on the broadcast. Oh, you know, you guys have been getting involved, telling us what you want to see. 
Uh, and uh, with the, the decks that we've been seeing, um, we'll only get to see those that keep on making a good journey. We've got past those early stages where we can bring out the unusual decks that eventually fizzle out. But you never know, last year we had a very unusual Arceus deck go all the way and win the tournament, uh, which was very unknown going into it. Yeah, but I think we finally got the request we wanted. I An uncommon think energy on the on the stage out there. I believe, yeah. Very good friend of us all will be interviewing him and finding out a little bit more.